This podcast is brought to you by Contessa Digital. Hey, love. Welcome back to Confidently Cherished. And today I wanted to talk to you about the struggles that modern women go through. And, you know, I am not a fan of that saying the struggle is real because although most of the time when people say it in like a joking manner, um, they don't think very much of it. But I truly believe that we speak our things into existence. And because of that, I'm a little hesitant of even using the word struggle in this podcast. Um, the reason why I am using it in the title and, and um, in the content of the podcast itself is because I was inspired by another podcast, uh, Awake with Jake. If you've never heard of it, Jake Woodward is a coach, teacher. He talks about masculine and feminine energy a lot. And he did a podcast episode several weeks ago about the modern struggles of men. So hearing his episode got me thinking about female struggles. And I kind of wanted to honor that, you know, (laughs) Um, I truly believe in giving credit where credit is due. So I wanted to honor that by talking about five of the struggles for modern women when it comes to not just dating, but really just even existing in this world and finding peace. And after I talk about these five, I want you to really continue the conversation with me over on Instagram and let me know what you think about these struggles and how they relate to you. So number one is the obsession with others. A lot of women are dealing with the struggle. I do think this is actually a struggle. I think struggle is the right word for it. Um, Dealing with the struggle of constantly having what other people do put on them. You know, there's just in general, the societal expectations of what it means to be a good girl, a good woman. And I'll get to that more in a second. But just things like, you know, particularly on TikTok, I have seen so many videos about, you know, why can't we have the relationships that our grandparents had? And, you know, it comes from both sides. You see women posting about that, saying that they just want to find a man who wants to be disciplined and who wants to do the work and and bring home a paycheck and provide for his family. And you see men posting, why can't modern women be like their grandmothers? They stayed in the, in the house. Um, you know, frankly, they put up with cheating and, and nonsense. And, you know, they cooked and cleaned and made sure the kids were taken care of. Why can't modern women be like that? And, (laughs) you know, whenever I see these videos, I think about the fact that one, you know, women stayed in marriage just because they had to. If you were a woman, you know, not that long ago, 50 years or so ago, if you were a woman, you couldn't have things like your own bank account. So yeah, of course, women stayed in marriages because if they didn't, they'd be destitute. They'd be homeless, you know. Um, and also this idea of, you know, a lot of these women who stayed in marriages, it's not like they actually made it easy for these these husbands, like men who did go outside the home, who did behave badly. It's not like these women took it lying down, you know. I'm just going to say as a black woman, and if this is true in your culture, you know, that may be the case, but I can't speak for anybody else's culture. Um, But as a black woman, I know a lot of stories of older black women who 
shot their husbands, beat their husbands with frying pans, <laughs> all sorts of abusive things and retaliation for cheating. So it's not the idyllic situation um, by any means. I don't think men and women, I don't think if you really took the time to think about how things were, quote unquote, back in the day, that you would want those types of relationships. But something about time passing, we put the shiny sheen of nostalgia all over it and make it seem like it was a great idea and like this was how things were supposed to be. And no, like nine times out of 10, like you look at a set of grandparents that you think were so great because you were young and you were a kid and you didn't know any better. But like a lot of times their relationships were pretty effed up, you know, (laughs) because of not necessarily just who they are as a person, but, you know, because of the way society's rules worked back then, because um, especially if you are a person of color, but, you know, really anyone, you know, therapy is to this day stigmatized. It was especially stigmatized back then. And, you know, a lot of us didn't even have access to it. So there's this obsession with looking at how others are in a situation not having all the information or not really thinking about all the information. Like, it's not just grandparents. It's this, you know, social media couples have become a thing, right? There are these different couples who have large accounts on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, what whatever your social media platform of choice is. And... I so often see people commenting like, oh my goodness, goals. Where do you find a man like that? I wish I could have a relationship with like that was like that. And thinking that this is what they should be looking up to. Thinking that, you know, these relationships are perfect. Thinking that, you know, if you're a woman, that you have to be like the woman in the video. Dress like her, you know, cook and clean like her or have the attitude she has, what whatever it is, there's something about her that you need to in order to have the relationship of your dreams. And first of all, the whole thing with outward appearances. You know, I grew up with a dad who's a minister. From time to time, he and my mom would counsel other couples, talk to them about their marriage struggles, help them work things out. So I learned at a very young age that there were people who seem very happy, um, you know, in this case at church on Sunday, but like Monday through Saturday was hell in their lives, right? Um, And now that I am a coach myself, you know, I still get amazed sometimes by the women who walk through my digital door because, you know, I, I coach online, I coach through Zoom, but you know, women come into my environment, they work with me. And when I meet them, you know, I have some some clients who are killing it, you know, (laughs) so they have these seemingly perfect lives. And, you know, uh, check their social media, they they have, it seems like they have everything. And, you know, on both sides, I have, you know, coach women who have everything but the man, quote unquote. So, you know, once you start talking to them and and once I start working with them, I realize that, you know, they grew up with a lot of unhappy patterns, um, a lot of generational trauma, things that are keeping them from, from not just finding that romantic relationship, but also preventing them from really being happy with their relationships with family, with friends, with their careers, all of that as well. And, you know, I, you know, 85% of the women that I work with when they come to me are single. But, you know, I work with some women who are in relationships that, you know, including some of these women who are in some of these couples that you see on social media. And, you know, everything seems glittery and gold on the outside. But, you know, once they start talking about all the issues that exist in the relationship... And even feeling this pressure to perform, this pressure to put on a show of a perfect relationship for the social media views, for the clicks, for the brand deals that they have. 
you know, you start to understand that there's so much more beneath the surface of everyone we meet, you know, whether you meet them in a, in a container of what I do for a living as a coach or just the person that you meet on the street or just the person who you started following on social media whose life seems okay. There's obviously going to be deeper things that they're not going to show on social media, but too often we get so caught up in that veneer, in that fantasy that we don't want to think about that possibility, right? And it is a struggle for a lot of women in general, but particularly single women, to be bombarded with all these messages of, you know, seeing couples and their families who've been married for 30, 40 years and being told that marriage is the way when the people, the couples who are telling you this may or may not be happy themselves. Um, the number of unhappily married women I see pushing unmarried women to get married is ridiculous. This is one of the reasons why I try very hard not to push marriage myself. And I know that may, that may sound strange as a dating coach, but one I enjoy my marriage. I am happy in my situation. I love my husband. But at the same time, the only reason why we got here, (laughs) you know what I mean? The only reason why we got to a happy situation was through a lot of personal work. um, Because both of us had childhood things, you know, that we had to overcome. Um, Both of us had adult things that we had to overcome and making a real commitment to both each other and to ourselves to consistently and constantly work on our growth. So I know for a fact that like going out and getting a man is not the answer, right? (laughs) Um, Being in a healthy romantic relationship will make your life better, full stop. It will make your life better in every other area of your life as well. It will motivate you to be better, to do better, to become a better person. Absolutely all that is true, but it's only true when the relationship is healthy and the relationship is only healthy when you and the other person have done work on yourselves, um, becoming good partners before you enter into a partnership with each other. So the just finding a man it's, it's not hard to, to find a man. Um, it's not hard for you to go out and, and just, you know, find someone. Take them home. Um, stay with them. Stay, you know, have a family and all that. Those things aren't hard. Doing them in a way that is healthy and keeps you happy and keeps you at peace. I don't even want to say that that's hard. Um, but it is, it is work. It is something you have to commit to. It's something you have to be incredibly intentional about. So this idea of constantly watching others without really knowing the contents, without knowing the work that they're putting in, or without knowing the work that they're not putting in, therefore it looks good on the surface, but it's falling apart behind the scenes, is this thing that I see so many women struggle with because they think that they're doing everything wrong, Um, but they they're not seeing the full picture. You know, even this whole idea of wife being a status symbol. (laughs) You know, I will see a woman say something, a woman who is single, say something that is true about relationships or about men. Something along the lines of, you know, I would never be in a relationship that I was being mistreated in and constantly giving someone chances because you always get what you tolerate. And if you show someone that you're going to put up with being mistreated, then, you know, you're not, you're going to continue to get mistreated. Let's say that's the thing that someone, a single woman has said. And I've seen unhappily married women try to argue her. Like, (laughs) you just don't have the patience. That's why you're single. You know, sometimes you have to struggle with someone for a long time. And 
the woman, again, who's single will say something like, you know, I'm not doing struggle of. And the married woman's retort will be, well, at least I'm married. Like, it is my goal and my dream as a coach for all women to have healthy relationships, to have loving relationships. It is my dream to see women being truly cherished, protected, for them to feel seen, for them to feel safe. And I hope that the work that I'm doing in my little corner of the world is making a difference. But part of that is recognizing that I would never want any woman who comes into my sphere, whether you're my sister or my client or uh, you just follow me on social media or listen to this podcast, I would never want you to be in a relationship for the sake of saying that you're in a relationship. That (laughs) it honestly sounds like a special kind of torture to me. Like, hear me out. Okay, so I would never want someone to be in a container like marriage that's created for love, but to not actually have the love, right? <laughs> I I can't imagine growing up dreaming of being married, getting into that partnership, having all these hopes and dreams for what it means to be taken care of, to have someone who is your partner, to have someone who truly sees you at a level of intimacy that you can't have in anything outside of a marriage and then to get none of that to be stuck in a bad relationship i i wouldn't want that on my worst enemy right so this obsession with appearances and what others are doing or saying or seeing It's a struggle that we have to let go of. It's a struggle that has to stop because we have to get ourselves to the point where it's nice to be inspired by others. Like I I tell clients of mine to, you know, follow women on social media who seem to be in happy relationships, right? Um, Use that as inspiration. But... Also be aware that at the end of the day, if you ever find out that this woman is not as happy as she portrays to be, um, if you ever find out something about that relationship that doesn't align with you, understand that you're still allowed to have your version of happiness and you're still allowed to have the relationship that you want. Um, People get so upset when celebrity couples have been together for 10, 15, 20, 30 years or whatever. And then they divorce and it's like, they're getting a divorce too. That's how upset they get about it. Like it's great to look at couples for inspiration. And it's great to look at the things that you see and say, Hey, I would want something like this in my own relationship in my own future. But I believe that God puts people in our lives, in our spheres, for reasons and you know he can put people in front of you as inspiration and as motivation but we can't make those people into gods right Uh, we have to understand that at the end of the day they are humans too so that is my first struggle with modern women and it dovetails into my second one and that is the idea of being the good girl I feel like pretty much every woman I've ever known, at least, has always struggled with this idea. And either that they work so hard to be the good girl to, and they become people pleasers, they become codependent, they end up in relationships that are unhealthy, or they grew up in an environment where they saw someone being, quote unquote, the good girl and being punished for it. So they work hard their entire lives to be the bad girl, to rebel, um, to leave people before they can get left. You know, 
And this whole idea of being nice, being helpful, being the good girl is utter trash. Like, can I say that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's trash. And here's why. You know, people talk about how, like, nice guys finish finish last. Nice girls finish last, too. These are the women who, you know, end up in placeholder relationships. You know, they are with a man for months, years, maybe even marry the man, and he's struggling. So she does all the things to lift him up to build his confidence, to build his self-esteem, to help him get better jobs, to help him get more educated. And <laughs> I I'm thinking about the the line from the from the old Kanye West song where he talks about, you know, when he get on, he going to leave your you know, for a white girl. <laughs> and and yeah, something to that extent, like no matter what race she is, she is the woman who expected more than than you did. She's the woman who expected more. And not only did she expect more, she got more. Um, you, sis, you built her up. So you built him up so that he could go give all of that, all those benefits to another woman. I think about women who spend so much time people pleasing with their families that they don't end up in healthy relationships outside their families, period. They don't get married. They don't have long-term romantic relationships. They don't have friendships because they spend their entire lives catering to their mom's needs or their dad's needs or, you know, someone else in the family that takes all the attention and takes all the life out of the family. Being a nice girl is often a breeding ground for resentment. I'm not saying don't be nice, right? <laughs> or actually, I am saying don't be nice. I want to clarify that. I'm not saying don't be a good person. But people can only love you at the level that you love yourself. So if you are not taking care of yourself, if you are not treating yourself well, you're not going to get that treatment from other people. I promise you that if you are the absolute sweetest to other people and you do everything that you can to make them happy, they will find other ways for you to make them happy. They're not going to find ways for you to be happy because they think you like that kind of treatment. They think that you like constantly doing for others or they don't even care as long as their needs are getting met. And this is not to be cruel. This is just human nature and how we all at. I guarantee you that you yourself, um, as you are listening to me right now, that you are the villain in someone's story. And maybe you intend it to be the villain in someone's story. So, you know, good for you if that's the case. But there are plenty of instances in which you thought that you were cool with someone. You thought everything was okay. And this person is talking bad about you. And it's not because that you are a terrible person. It's because that person never made their needs known. They expected you to be a mind reader. You acted what you thought was the best way you could act. And it went against what they wanted out of the relationship. Doesn't make either person on either side wrong. It's just a matter of, especially as women, <laughs> you know, we're we're taught to go along to get along and we're not taught to really express our boundaries, our standards, our expectations. And when we don't express those, they get those boundaries, those standards, those expectations, they get unmet. Our needs and our wants, they get unmet. And because they get unmet, we oftentimes end up blaming other people and being upset with them for them not meeting our needs when we didn't know how to express them and how to ask for them in the first place. Which is why, again, I guarantee there is somebody out there, you are the villain in their story, <laughs> no matter how nice you are. So we have to move away from this whole idea of being nice or being good. We have to take care of ourselves first. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to know what it is that we want in life. 
once we know what we want in life, we find people, we find our relationships that are in alignment with that. So if you reach a point in your personal development and personal growth journey where you're not in alignment with what your family wants and needs, you know, maybe you set higher boundaries with them. You go low contact with them or no contact at all, even if if that's what's necessary. And then you have the relationships you choose. So, you know, the relationships in your career, what job you take, or if you own a business, whether or not to keep that business or to leave it and start something new, or uh, your relationships with your friends, your relationships with romantic partners. And you only choose people who are aligned with the things that you want. Because this is not selfishness. This is not being uppity. This is not thinking that you are better than someone. It is a recognition that if you are in relationships with people who are aligned with you, your values, um, your desires, and how it is that you want to be loved, how it is that you want to be treated, that you will be happier and that these people will be happier as well because they know that they can love you and treat you in the way in which you want to be loved and treated and that you can do the same for them because when there's value alignment, when there's lifestyle alignment, then that's just easier. And then once you choose your circle, it is your obligation to be kind to everyone you encounter, everyone you surround yourself with, everyone you meet. And kindness involves compassion. It involves empathy. It involves being intentional about the way in which you say things. It does not involve lighting yourself on fire to keep other people warm. So, you know, we deal with the struggles of keeping up with how others see things and react and say things. And we deal with the struggles of being the good girl. Another struggle that the modern woman is dealing with is this balance between our masculine energy and our feminine energy. Because as women, we have both masculine and feminine energy. Men do as well. And, you know, for so long, we were taught to suppress anything that was masculine, right? So it was all about feminine energy, being soft, being pretty, not thinking, right? All of that stuff. And we moved out of the housewives era and feminism came along. And then we were told that everything that was feminine about us was bad, right? (laughs) It was all about, I am woman, hear me roar. Um, I can do anything a man can do. I can even do it better than a man. Uh, I need to be assertive. I need to take all this action and do all these things. And now, you know, social media, you hear a lot about hypergamy and soft life And there's all this talk about getting back into your feminine and women being too masculine. And that's why they're single. And that's why you ain't got a man because you're so masculine. You know, that type of talk. And I think a lot of it, honestly, comes from, you know, every generation kind of flip flops. Um, They realize that certain things about their way of living don't work. So instead of being nuanced about it, they go to the next extreme. (laughs) So I think a lot of the soft life talk now comes from the burnout that came with the feminist era. The idea that we could do anything, therefore we should do anything and we should do everything and we should work like 60 hours a week and all that craziness, you know, (laughs) and that never depend on a man means like never allow a man to do anything for you. So One of our struggles now as modern women is getting to the place where we have that balance. It's important for me to sometimes operate in my masculine energy, right? Because I'm a business owner. So being a business owner requires me to go out there, to take action, um, to aggressively pursue goals it requires me to be a boss. I have an assistant. So, um, you know, soft life and, (laughs) and feminine energy, you know, that occasionally comes into play as, as a boss, but a lot of 
leadership is is using masculine energy and you know I have to sometimes use masculine energy with my clients I am a container for them I am a safe space for them that requires me to have a little bit of dominance when I'm talking to them and it comes out of a place of love And when I do it, I always keep my feminine energy in mind because I understand the importance of nurture as well. But that that masculine energy has to be there. Right. My feminine energy is also really important. Again, back with my clients, I have to have um, a nurturing energy with them sometimes. Like I have to balance those energies as a woman. Um. My feminine energy is just important as far as my self-care goes. As a business owner, creativity is feminine, is feminine energy. So that's really important. Both these energies are incredibly vital, incredibly important. And they're also just as powerful as the other. I don't know why people refer to women as being the weaker sex or (laughs) talk about feminine energy as if it's weak. It's incredibly powerful, um, especially when it's used correctly. But we keep going in these circles. And, you know, I'm calling this episode Struggles of the Modern Woman. But (laughs) these are struggles that have existed for generations. Again, this constant battle between should women be you know, 100% feminine and and fit all the stereotypes of female? Or do they need to be more aggressive and, you know, take over newsrooms? And uh, I used to be a journalist before I became a coach. So (laughs) whenever I think of corporate environment, newsroom is the first place, the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, But newsrooms, corporate offices, uh, politics, should women take over all these things and aggressively take over them and like, you know, batter men down into submission, right? Um, So it is a balance. And as a woman, really as a man as well, but, um, you know, I mostly talk to women. So as a woman, it is really important for us to find that balance, to know when it's appropriate to dominate in your masculine and when it's appropriate to dominate in your feminine. But because we hear and see so many mixed messages on media in general, whether that's social media or the news or even just the conversations that we're having with family and friends, Um, finding that balance can take a while. It can take a lot of practice and a lot of intentional work. You know, this brings me into point number four, talking about work, the need to do it all. Again, (laughs) we get so many mixed messages in our society So there's the doing it all as we can do anything a man can do. Therefore, we should push and hustle and grind. And I don't believe in that. The the older I get, the less I believe in hustle and grind culture. Because I've even seen, like, I'm in my 30s, right? And (laughs) I've even seen at my age, women who are my age and even myself deal with health issues that you would associate with someone who's much older and a lot of it comes down to stress a lot of it comes down to hustle and burnout you know I've seen in my own life being you know ridiculously sick because I was stressing myself out and burning myself out and then making that intention to calm down to cut people out of my life to cut things out of my life um, to do less to breathe more (laughs) And all of a sudden being so much healthier, right? So there's this push for us as modern women to do it all from that point of having so much more masculine energy. And then also from that feminine side, from particularly the feminine energy trait of nurture to, back to what I was saying early, to be people pleasers, to be the good girl who's always there for everyone else. 
and, you know, screw whether or not you actually need a moment to yourself every once in a while. <laughs> you know, your your mom, your cousin, your sister, your brother, your uncle, your friend, your coworker, someone else needs you right now and therefore you must drop your needs and sabotage your own self to help other people. There is so much peace in learning to let things go. Sometimes you just have to drop it. And if you're struggling with that, no judgment, because I constantly struggle with it. (laughs) When I just said a few minutes ago, I've had that experience of like having health problems. And then once I learn to de-stress and take on less, they go away. I'm not talking about a one-time occurrence in my life. You would think that all it would take is one time for me to learn my lesson, but not so much. So I get it. I truly get it. Um, But I want you to keep in mind, sometimes you have to just let stuff drop. And as I'm saying this to you right now, you probably have in mind something that needs to drop. There is someone that you have been taking care of who is a grown man or a grown woman and who is more than capable of handling the ish themselves and you need to let them handle the ish themselves. Or there is a task at work, responsibility at work, that was never part of your job description. And for some reason, you started taking this on and you were allowed to take it on. And now they keep piling more stuff on you and you're not getting a bigger title for it or a bigger uh, pay for it. You need to let things drop and you need to make it clear that you need to do what is in your job description (laughs) and not more. Or you are in a situation with friends or, you know, I personally grew up as the youngest child in my household, but I have enough friends who are the older or oldest sibling in their household to at least be aware of the struggle. So, you know, maybe you are the oldest daughter, the older one, and Or you have friends who, because of your life experience and your wisdom, even if you aren't significantly older than these friends, they kind of treat you like you're the big sister and they put so much burden on you and you love them. You love them to death. You want to see them win. You want to see them happy. You want to see them do better, but you can't make a person grow up if They don't want to grow up themselves. You can't make them change if they're not ready for change. And you cannot coddle someone into freedom. (laughs) In order for them to find that freedom on on their own, they have to take those steps on their own. And in this situation, you need to drop it. You just need to drop it. So whatever it is, I encourage you to find a way this week this month over the next few days um, I encourage you to find a way to drop it just drop it and then that brings me to my last struggle of modern woman and that is chasing the clock so when my husband and I first started dating um, he used to say something that would annoy the hell out of me honestly. (laughs) And the thing that he would say would happen whenever I was rushing to do something. So not necessarily a situation where we actually had to be someplace at a certain time. You know what I mean? Like the start of a movie. But if we were running errands, for example, like maybe he had gone with me to the grocery store and then you know we had a couple other places to go and I was just trying to do things in a hurry so that I could get back home he would say to me oh love 
we have more time than life. And again, I would find that incredibly annoying, (laughs) just to be honest. Um, I don't know if my husband actually listens to my podcast, but um, babe, if you are listening, I apologize. (laughs) Because I never told him that I found it annoying. And I'm glad I didn't because eventually I got what he was saying. Um, it it just, it took me a while to get it. Like, I hear business coaches talking all the time about how like, you know, you can always get money back as a resource, um, but you can't get back time. So, you know, that's why you, you should spend $25,000 on their coaching program so that you can learn to do things faster because you can't get back time. And <laughs> like, in a way, like, yes, that's true. Um, time does fly. I, I can't believe that we are reaching the end of the year as I'm recording the this podcast episode. So yeah, time does fly. We we all die. Time is finite because, you know, everyone, every human has a time in which they were born and a time for them to die. So I get that perspective. At the same time, you know, I think about Things that I have been through in my life, adversities that I've overcome. And I think about there being a Bible verse, and I'm sorry because right now I'm having a moment where (laughs) talking about being the good girl, I feel like a really bad preacher's daughter right now because I can't think of the exact scripture that this is. But there is a Bible verse that talks about God renewing your time. And because I have a little bit more life experience on me now, like I can look back and I can see ways in which I know this is going to sound hokey and corny to anyone who's listening to me who still has like a two or even a one in the front of their age. But, (laughs) you know, there's so much more to go of my 30s. So, you know, maybe I should revisit this podcast episode when I'm, you know, in my 40s. But of my 30s so far, I can say that they have already been so much better than my 20s, right? Um, <laughs> I think about like, yeah, there there are some obvious things like I dealt with really serious chronic health conditions in my 20s and you know now I'm I'm in the best health of my life um and my health has been getting better each day so there there's that obvious one there's the um quote unquote struggles of being single although you know honestly I I enjoyed my single season I had a lot of great experiences but like I was more than, by the time I got married, I was ready to be married. And being in that season now, I'm like, you know, I'm very content in in this season of marriage. I have no desire to go back to my single season. You know, I think about friendships that I have and how, you know, the people that I am no longer friends with (laughs) the relationships that I let go of and how like those were really good decisions, the relationships that I've gained. And then I think about the relationships that have been steady. You know, I have friends that I've been friends with since elementary school, friends that I've been friends with since middle school, since high school, since college, etc. And the people who have stayed in my life They've stayed for a reason, and also my relationships with them are better and deeper. So there are so many ways in which I can say that my 30s are better than my 20s. And I say that to you because it is such a struggle of the modern woman to constantly chase the clock and timelines. You know, there's this whole idea of like, yeah, you know, go to college at 18, graduate at 22, get married at 23, first kid by 24 or 25, you know, and 
I I legit have friends who have lived that life. You know, as I, as I think about it, I have friends who got their MRS. You know, they got married right around the time they graduated college and had kids right away. And they're happy. You know, they're they're living good lives. So I'm not downplaying that. At the same time, I also know women who didn't get married until much later and, you know, had kids later. And by later, you know, I can think of like family, friends and all who didn't get married and have kids until their 40s, right? (laughs) And they had great lives in the first half of their lives and they're having great lives now in the second half, right? Um, I can think of women who are happily single in their 40s or 50s and, and beyond. This is, this is something I talk to some of my clients about, about making sure that if you want marriage, because let's, let's be clear, like if a woman's coming to me, she typically wants marriage. And if a woman doesn't want marriage, that's fine. You know, I've had women that I've worked with who kind of want more of an Oprah Stedman deal. Um, or they are happily living the single life. And I've had women come to me with like navigating the conversations with their families. Like, yo, by the way, I ain't never getting married. I ain't never having kids. I know you wanted a grandchild, but that's not happening. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so... I lost my train of thought for a second, guys. I'm sorry. Um, What I was saying is that, you know, most of the women, though, who come to me want marriage. And there's nothing wrong with wanting marriage as long as you're understanding why it is that you want it. (laughs) And as long as you're understanding that the marriage is only valuable if it's actually making you happy. Um when you get into situations where you settle because you're desperate or you settle because you think the clock is ticking, like marriage is useless. In fact, marriage will then drag you because you'll settle for someone who is far beneath you and they will drag you down to where they are. Or you'll just be in a situation where you're generally not happy. And when you're not happy, you're not at your best. So it's important that when we think about what it is that we want in our lives, what our desires are, yes, I believe you should be intentional. I believe that you should go after it. I believe that if you think this is something that you struggle with and that you need accountability for, strategy for, teaching for, you should go out and get those things. Like, I wouldn't be a coach if... <laughs> If I didn't believe that, but at the same time, you know, it's one of the things I look for with clients. You know, when a woman comes to me and says that she wants to get married and she needs help with finding the right man or discerning the right man or uh, being the woman that she needs to be to attract the right man. I want to hear that her reasons for wanting to get married are about the legacy she wants to create or about the or about breaking generational curses and and unhealthy generational patterns or I want to hear her talk about you know the how she believes that she could be a great partner to someone else and how they could help improve her life as well You know, I don't really want to hear a woman talking so much about the clock is ticking. Like, yes, that can be a concern. Um, Biology is a thing. So (laughs) I totally understand that like the majority of women who come to me are going to be in their late 20s and early 30s. And a lot of that has to do with a desire to get married, um, a desire to have children and fertility. But when that is the only thing you're concerned about and it's all just about needing to like marry by 30 or die or marry by 35 or bust, 
when that is your obsession, you're missing out on all the life that is happening around you. You're missing out on all the lessons you should be learning about relationships and about communication. You're missing out on all these beautiful moments that are happening in your life. You know, friends getting married, friends getting promotions, starting businesses. Not that you don't notice those things, but you're not fully present in those moments because all you can do is obsess over, oh, my friend's getting married. I wonder if there's going to be a good looking guy at the wedding. Like (laughs) you're so focused on that, that you're not really enjoying all the beautiful moments happening at said wedding. Chasing the clock it is understandable, given the way we're programmed by society. But it's not productive. It's not helpful. You know, if you're if you're a Christian like me, then you hear so much of Ecclesiastes and this whole thought of to everything that there's a season, and how things come in their own time. And saying it is beautiful and poetic, but most people don't live it. People will say, yeah, things will happen when they're supposed to happen. But then they pray or meditate, go to the universe, you know, insert your thing. And when they do so, they talk about like, oh, yeah, I completely understand that everything happens in this time. But the time for this to happen needs to be next year because I'm sick of being lonely. That's not how it works. Like, that's not how any of this works. And it's not how you want it to work. I always trust that. Let me say it this way. Um, When I think of some of the biggest things that I have accomplished when I think of the biggest things that I have gotten that I desire, um, pretty much none of those things happen the way I expected them to happen. You know, I didn't meet my husband the way that I expected it to happen. Um, in my journalism career, I was nominated for two Emmys and the stories that got nominated were not what I was expecting. <laughs> like, um, like I just I just think about all these different things that happen in my life that they happen. I'm grateful that they happen, but they didn't come how I thought they were going to. And once you kind of make the the realization that that's how it's always going to be for the rest of your life, <laughs> you know, you can choose to panic about it and be desperate about it, or you could also you know, be thankful and show some gratitude for how beautiful You can show some gratitude for the fact that you get to be on this adventure for the rest of your life. You can show some gratitude for not getting things before you were ready for them. Um, Again, I think about friends of mine who like got their MRS and all that. And I think about the man who I was dating in college around the time I graduated. And... This is not to knock him. He's a good guy. Um, I was about to say what he does for a living. But if I said what he does for a living, I might give away uh, too much information about him. So um, when I think about that man, though, again, good man. Um, I We have mutual friends. So I know that he is, um, I know that he's married and he has kids now and he's doing very well for himself. So, like, nothing wrong, but he and I were wrong for each other. And because he and I were wrong for each other and we just wanted really different things in life, there's no doubt in my mind, absolutely no doubt, that if he and I had gotten married after I graduated, then I would 100% be divorced right now. (laughs) And... Not only would I be divorced by now, but if I had gotten married at that age and he and I probably wouldn't have lasted more than a few years. And I think about what I would have, the way I was a few years after I graduated college, um, I would also totally be bitter and resentful, um, (laughs) 
because I wouldn't have had the emotional maturity. I wouldn't have had the tools to handle an event like that. Right? Like, don't get the, don't get me wrong. Love my husband. Plan to be with him truly till death do his part. At the same time, I now have the confidence in myself to know that no matter what happens, divorce, death, whatever, um, we stay together for the rest of our lives and we live happily ever after. Um, no matter what happens, I'm okay. Like I can always take care of myself. I will. I have that resilience. I have that confidence. And having that resilience, having that confidence, having that knowing, it actually makes me a better wife because I don't come into our marriage from a place of desperation, right? Um, I come into it from a place of love and wanting to become better myself and wanting to do what I can to help someone in their journey to become better without trying to take over that journey, you know, (laughs) allowing them to live it. So these are the struggles of a modern woman Um, being obsessed with what others think, do and say. Being a good girl. Being able to balance your masculine and your feminine energies. This need to do it all and be it all. And finally, this need to chase the clock and be hell-bent on allowing things to happen on certain timelines. Yeah, let me know what you think of these struggles. Are these actually struggles for you? Um, Of the ones I listed, what do you struggle with the most? Let me know what you think. Um, Follow me and comment on my Instagram, I am at Keisha Rice, K-E-S-H-I-A-R-I-C-E. Um, let's continue the conversation over there. You can DM me or you can, you know, comment on my latest post. And I will talk to you soon. Love you so much. Bye. Hey there. So you made it all the way to the end of the episode, which means I have two things to say. One, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. And two, you like me. You really like me. So I would appreciate it if you would show that like by subscribing to this podcast so that more people can hear about it and enjoy it as much as you do. And if you want to know more about any of the links that I mentioned on this episode or any guests that I've had, be sure to go to KeishaRice.com slash links. That's K-E-S-H-I-A-R-I-C-E dot com slash links. I can't wait to talk to you again in the next episode. So see you then.